And so some breaking news, August jobs report was out earlier this hour. 235,000 jobs were added back into the U.S. economy during the month of August. That was a huge miss. Wall Street was looking for 733,000. Unemployment rate did fall slightly, falling down to 5.2%. We want to bring back in our panel. We have Emily Rowland, John Hancock, investment management, COA chief investment strategist, and Anthony Chan, former Chase chief economist. Emily, first to you, because right before we went to the break, you were saying that it's a more challenging backdrop right now. So I guess with that in mind, just in terms of where investors are looking for opportunity, how should investors be positioned going into the final couple months of the year? Well, I think it's clear that the Fed is really going nowhere in this environment. Uh, you know, we're seeing a slowdown in jobs growth. It's not horrible, by the way, not a terrible report. Uh, but definitely challenges the narrative that the Fed has laid out, that they're looking for a spring of better economic data, and they want to see a healing of the labor market. And I think that that this data this morning really slows that narrative down. So potentially we see some hinting around tapering in September, potentially a formal announcement at the November Fed meeting. But for now, our position has been that rates are going to continue to remain low. Uh, for investors, that means that every little percent counts in the fixed income market. Being in cash and ultra short duration strategies isn't going to cut it in this environment, particularly as we're continuing to see inflationary pressures build. So moving into the intermediate part of the curve, invest, uh, embracing corporate credit, adding a little bit of high yield bonds on there for yield potential. You know, we're still in an expansionary period here. You've got to find that additional income. And you've got to be really thoughtful and selective right now within the fixed income market, given this new regime of low rate. Anthony, it's really clear. Uh, the economic recovery from the pandemic has stalled. And I giggled a little bit to this message I just received from a, from a contact saying, Brian, uh, the economy might need a new round of fiscal stimulus, but maybe I shouldn't be giggling. Uh, do you think now you know, officials should be looking at a fresh round of stimulus here? I think, uh, Brian, that at this time, uh, you did see these numbers uh, come off the boil, and Emily's right. Uh, but what I think it does is, more than anything else, give uh, Chair Powell a little bit of breathing room. Uh, everybody says, oh, what's going on? Wages went up a little bit more than expected, and employment is softer. Well, again, as you mentioned earlier, Brian, the leisure and hospitality sector, which is generally and historically a lower wage uh, sector, if that one is soft, and, and the other sectors that have higher wages are, are the ones that are expanding employment. Of course, it's going to boost the average hourly earnings number. So I think it gives uh, Chair Powell a little bit of breathing room. But I think that the uh, the momentum is there. I mean, whenever historically, whenever you get upper revisions in the prior months, generally it tells you that there is positive momentum. There's 11.2 million workers that will be losing benefits uh, the first week in September. You can't tell me that. Out of those 11.2 million workers, some of them are not going to be uh, somewhat motivated to actually start paving the pavement and, and, and returning back to work. So I expect that employment uh, will be a much stronger in the next couple of months than we saw in this report, which I think is somewhat biased. When you look at the household survey and when you look at the, the components that missed, uh, we're going to see the recovery in the next couple of months. So I, I think it's premature to, to assume that we need a uh, huge stimulus at this point, especially when households are sitting on close to $2 trillion worth of savings. I always like to help households, but the question is, are we at a critical juncture? I don't think so. Anthony, so it sounds like you, you don't think we should be putting too much weight then into this report, just given some of the factors that you laid out, especially the fact that the extended unemployment benefits are expiring this week, so that's not reflected in the numbers that we just got. But I guess my question to you in regards to that is why haven't we seen from the states that did expire those benefits early, I guess, why haven't we seen a bigger correlation just in terms of people looking for jobs when they aren't receiving those benefits anymore? Because we haven't really seen a strong uptick in some of those states yet. Shauna, that's an excellent question, because a lot of people are asking, when you look at the states, the half of the states that actually cut those benefits and, and the other half that did not, you don't see any statistical difference. And the answer is pretty straightforward. And that is because there are more than one factor out there that influence whether you return to work. Yes, when you cut the benefits, economic incentives do work. And most economists will tell you that if you do that, it's gonna motivate people to go back to work. 
But what are the other factors? The other factors are how concerned are you about catching COVID? We saw a surge in, in COVID. And by the way, many of those states or the preponderance of those states actually saw a rise in COVID cases in the South. And so on the one hand, uh, these cutting of the benefits motivate you to go and seek employment. But the concern about the uh, COVID uh, uh, catching it is, is actually pushing you in the other direction. The good news is that vaccination rates are going up, and that means that the severity of COVID moving forward is probably going to wane to some extent. So I think that moving forward, things are going to improve. Schools are opening up. That was another factor that was holding back uh, people. And child care issues, which are were serious, and now with the child care credit going into effect, all those things are going to reverse course. So I think now we almost have the perfect storm that in the next couple of months, we will see employment. But that's an excellent question. And I think the short answer is the more than one factor that's determining whether people return to work and the other factors were pushing you in the other direction. Jared Blickery, uh, let's get you back into this conversation. I know you've been listening in here. How do you think traders will take this report? On the one hand, to me, it seems like it would delay. The miss itself would delay a Fed taper until later this year. But again, it's clear the economy is stalled out here. Um, I don't know that it's I don't know that the economy while well, the economy is not as good as it could be, but I don't know if it's stalled out. And I, I think we're having a great discussion here. I don't think the headline number is revealing the weakness that um, would be apparent or that you would think intuitively. Um, and I agree with the prior comments about the leisure and hospitality sector. You know, things are going to bounce back here. But let's take a look at the Wi-Fi interactive for the price action. So these are Nasdaq futures and we're going to look intraday. And I, last time we checked out this chart, we had spiked up, but now you can see we've come down. And in fact, we're heading right back up. A lot of times these, uh, these payroll reports cause knee-jerk reactions in both directions. And if you take a look at the percentage moves here, they're very small. The market is almost saying uh, this is not a big deal. You take a look at what's going on in gold, we're seeing a little bit more action there. We're seeing a spike up and uh, we're maintaining those gains. So you take a look at this three month chart of gold and it's right back up into this resistance. I think this is going to be a really interesting day for gold. See if it can punch through or if it comes back down. Uh, this right here was a market clearing event in the gold market, we had a flash crash on a Sunday evening. Um, so if gold keeps heading higher, that's sending a message potentially that yes, the market expects the Fed to to, um, to print, you know, in quotes for longer. So uh, a couple more charts here. Let's check out check out cop copper futures. Very very small movement to the upside here. And uh, let's get back. I want to check out um, some of the other markets. We did S and let's do S and P 500 futures here as well. And you can see just more knee jerk reactions in both directions. Um, and also important to point out that this is a Friday before Labor Day, and I'd be surprised if there's more than five traders at the desk right now. So um, take this with a grain of salt. There will be some digestion of these headline numbers over the next uh, few hours. And um, you know, I, I think this is an important report, but I don't think the market is making much of it right now. Emily, uh, Emily let me get back to you. Wrap this up uh, for us here. How should traders think about trading after this report. Like I just mentioned to Jared, headline miss, but perhaps it delays a taper. I mean, do you stay in those high growth stocks that have been working for the most part over the summer? Yeah, so interesting reversal in the market action. And I think perhaps investors are waking up to the idea that if this taper is delayed due to weaker data, you know, maybe I don't want to own 10 year treasuries and we're seeing the yield back up here. Uh, and maybe I do want to embrace stocks if the party continues to go on with Powell staying on the sidelines. So what that means for, for us from an equity standpoint is we're moving away from peak growth, but growth is still decent in the U.S. So you want to own equities, but you want to be very thoughtful about how you do it. You want to look for those high quality companies and sectors, ones that can withstand margin pressure that's emerging, ones that can grow organically even as the market or the economic environment flows or moderate here. So it's high quality companies, it's technology, communication services, sprinkle in a little bit of cyclicality there, particularly like areas like industrials and U.S. mid-cap equities, and really maintain that balance as we head into the kind of the meat of the mid-cycle environment here. 
Emily Rollin, John Hancock, investment management, co-chief investment strategist, and Anthony Chan, former Chase chief economist. Thanks to, your, uh, to you both for helping us break down these numbers. And again, just to recap some of the numbers that we have been getting out over the last 30 minutes, jobs, a big miss here for the August jobs report coming in at 235,000. You can see it on your screen. The expectation from the street was 733,000. Unemployment rate falling, coming in with the street's expectations of 5.2%. The average hourly wages, that number that we know is so critical here for so many uh, investors. They're watching closely also just in terms of what this could mean potentially for inflation and the Fed gauge going forward here. But that coming in at 4.3 percent, the expectation was for a year over year gain of 3.9 percent. Month over month gain, we saw six tenths of a percentage point. So that in reading uh, coming in a bit.